that's all it is. And, and that, that's the same thing with real estate agents. Um, my opinions based on my experiences and the time that I put in to learn this craft. Um, so I, I think that things being subjective just kind of create a environment where everybody can try to be their best and keep learning. My name is Kevin McIntosh, and this is The Closing Table, where we talk to experts about their experience in real estate all across the country. Let's go. to the closing table go ahead and pull up a seat and meet me right here my name is kevin c mcintosh your host and joining us on this episode ready to drop some knowledge for us we want to welcome orlando herrera how you doing orlando doing good kevin thank you for having me hey man thank you thank you first off for uh taking time out of your busy busy schedule to be with us and secondly and serving in the military you you did serve in the air force correct i did i did i appreciate that Thank you, thank you, thank you. We want to honor you for that, man, first and foremost. And we are here to talk about real estate, all right? So before we do that, we like to start off a little light. Got a quick game for you. It's called This or That. It's exactly what it sounds like. Some real estate words and or terms, phrases that are related to real estate, like I said. But uh, they're, they're a little bit contrary to each other in most cases. So I just need you to choose one. And if you want, you can tell us why you chose it. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right, all right. First one, real estate investment trusts, aka REITs, or direct property ownership. I like direct property ownership. Makes sense. Secondly, property management or self management. Property management. Mm, okay. I'm in the self management part right now. Property management. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Buy and hold or fix and flip? Mm. So tough. I, I'm going to say buy and hold. Okay. Okay. Last one. Cash flow or appreciation? Cash flow. Mm. Mm. I would agree with that, by the way. Just yes, to sir. let you know. Cool, man. Cool, cool. Thanks for starting that off. For All sure. Right. So we started off with a game. Now let's start off with you and your name. In 60 yep. seconds or less, I'd like for our guests to kind of tell us who they are outside of real estate, please. Yeah, uh, that's kind of tough. I think most real estate uh, professionals can say that real estate takes up their whole life. Um, mm -hmm. But outside of that, I'm a dad, a new dad, about 10 months now. I'm a husband. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in between work, I'm I'm trying to fill in those windows with family as much as I can. I try to sneak in a round of golf if I can during the summer here. <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> um, but really, I, I'm an entrepreneur, man. I, I really mm -hmm. enjoy real estate. I like business. Um, and I spend a lot of time learning about it if uh, I'm not with the family or if I'm not out having fun with friends golfing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Good to know, man. Human, just like all of us, a dad, a husband, like he says, we, we got to respect that, man. We got to respect that. So, um, getting into the business, business part of it. Um, let's start off by you describing your market, um, that you're currently serving right now, start off geographically and then just tell us economically what's going on in the real estate part of it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really trying to expand all over Michigan. Uh, my broker EXP, they really push uh, having resources outside of your market. Florida, mm -hmm. I've done referrals in Texas, but my main market is Michigan, Southeast Michigan, Oakland County. Okay. Um, I, we are in Gladwin, which is like central Michigan right now. And I've even been doing some work in Traverse City. I've uh, done work in Grand Rapids. So I'm trying to get on my window still game. I, I, I've noticed uh, I get listings in Gladwin. You guys got a photographer out in Gladwin. Yes, we do. And I just thought that was pretty powerful. And, and I really have been trying to model my business similar to how window still has done what they've done. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, but to get uh, more focused on my local market, Oakland County, um, I love Pontiac. I'm born and raised in Pontiac. I really like that market. That market's really why I got into real estate. You know, okay. the 2008 crash, prices dropped. People were buying houses for uh, five, ten thousand dollars all in. 
I know somebody who's bought maybe 10 of those and held them since 2008. Mm -hmm. And so once I saw that, I was like, oh, okay, real estate's definitely the way to go. Um, even if you can, if you can make a million dollars in a market like Pontiac, which is, you know, lower income, then anything's possible. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea about the main market I'm in, but really Waterford, Clarkston, Northern Oakland County is where I do most of my transactions. Okay. And, uh, those are like the stepping stones outside of Pontiac. So, uh, Waterford right now, where I currently reside, that's like the 200, 300 K range. And you usually get those subdivisions where you got all the same brick ranches yeah stacked on top yeah so that's that's my market right there right. okay okay good 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 I'm, I'm a little familiar with the area not too familiar with pontiac i've been to waterford a few times maybe pontiac once or twice arbor hills area only because i've been to a pistons game you know uh -huh. back in back when they were Rest out in there peace, the palace. i know right man i drove past there recently and saw there was nothing but just like the led sign i was like what it's sad. Same uh, with the Silver Dome. You ever yeah, been to the oh, Silver Dome? Oh yeah. Oh man, man. We man, they're, they're, we just giving away our age right there. Giving <laughs> 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 away our age. All right. So listen, man. Let's let's talk about the transaction of buying a home and things that go into it. Starting with a healthy credit score, in the history of your credit score, how it always helps when purchasing a home. Paying rent can be a way to improve your credit nowadays. Also, so how can you help your credit? Um, get better while paying rent. Do you you have any insight on that? How someone can do that? I do actually. Uh, Experian has a service now where you can record your rent or report your rent as to your credit report or bureaus. Um, so that's something you can do. I personally have a friend that I I've hired to monitor my credit and help me improve my credit. Mm. And uh, that's something I want to tell people who are looking to buy a house. Sometimes people reach out to me and they find out their credit's too low and then they just stop. And it's like a very achievable thing to get your credit up. Uh, it's just something that you got to pay attention to and be diligent with, such as making sure that your rent gets reported to the credit bureaus. Mm, that's a good point. That's a good point. Some things I don't think has been shared on the closing table right here. And yeah, yeah. If you're paying rent, you know, especially if you if you care about your credit or you at least want to at least own a home, you should care about your credit. Yeah, if you have an opportunity to report that and have that taking like taking some type of effect on your credit in a good way at least, yeah, absolutely report that. I'm I have I have the same thing taken care of with mine. So yeah. until I actually get my actual home, then I'm I'm covered in the same way. So I'm glad you brought some perspective on that. Um Well, it's because if you sorry, I didn't mean if no, you can please, pay rent. Please. If you can pay rent, you can pay a mortgage. Mortgages well now yes. that interest rates have gone up, they're pretty high now, but if you can afford a rent payment, you can absolutely afford a mortgage payment. I agree. So that, yeah. Especially depending on your market where rent can be like $1,200 or something like that. Even, uh, even, bedroom. even a thousand dollars or more. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. see what you can do with, with a mortgage. See, see what you can qualify for. And a lot of people would be surprised at least. Yeah. A CMA, Comparative Market Analysis. This is something I know you're familiar with. It's used to determine property value relative to properties in that same proximity. Can you explain your process for preparing a preliminary CMA to establish fair market value? You said it perfectly. I, I literally wrote exactly that. Most similar, closest proximity within 30 years. And I wrote this in all caps, same school district. Mm. Um, so like I... I had a mm. listing in Pontiac. She wanted a really high price for it. And I was like, I don't know. I, I don't think so with the Pontiac School District. Well, we ended up finding some Auburn Hills comps that had Pontiac School District. And we were able to use those comps. And we ended up selling for record price in, the, in her street, in her neighborhood. Really? Yeah, so same school district is very important uh, when running a market analysis. And really, I say put yourself in the appraiser's shoes. Um, all appraisers are different. So when you're uh, doing a comparative market analysis, you're just trying to imagine what the house would appraise for. Mm. That's true. And 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 I, I just recently had this conversation. Value is subjective. Value is subjective, right? I mean, what the seller will probably think the value is, the buyer will probably think something completely different. And then the appraiser himself, him or herself, will probably think something completely different. 
So you I get mean, two different appraisals and they'll both be different. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I, I think it it's a little bit of it, and I hate to stay, take this from another episode. It's literally like an, an art and a science. I'm yes. trying to find a way to mix all of that to so that everybody understands like where we can meet on this real value of this home. So I think that's what's protecting real estate agents' careers. Really? Uh, is it being subjective? Zillow's great. Zillow's getting good, but those estimates don't include experience. They don't include knowledge of the market, seeing what's going on in the areas, what new businesses are coming, or what kind of growth might hit hit the area, or what kind of decline might hit the area. Mm. So I think uh, with I love that it is subjective. Uh, yeah. People get really mad at appraisers sometimes because two of them are having different opinions, but I think that's what keeps us in business. That's an interesting perspective. And you feel like that's ultimately because you, I mean, because the real estate agents technically, I hate to say it, but perspective on the value. Yeah. It, it, mm. it gives us value as well. Hmm. That's that's a unique way of looking at it. I, I actually like that. I like that approach. I, I can agree with that. Actually, I can agree because ultimately you're looked at as the home professionals. The the yeah. PhD. You have a PhD. Like uh, the average consumer looks at you. You have a PhD in this real estate stuff. Right. So we assume you know exactly what you're talking about. And yeah, the appraiser. This is literally what they do too. But as a consumer, I'm thinking, or as a client, I'm thinking like. Yo, yeah. if, if my real estate agent said it's this and the appraiser saying anything lower or something like that or something different, I'm going with my real estate agent. You know what I'm saying? And I can, I can see that. My uh, wife's grandfather's a uh, pediatrician, and he said he has a saying that I have an educated opinion. That's all it is. And, and that, that's the same thing with real estate agents. Uh, my opinions based on my experiences and the time that I put in to learn this craft. Um, so I, I think that things being subjective just kind of create a environment to where everybody can try to be their best and keep learning. I like that perspective even more now that you said that. that that's a great way of putting it. Okay, great, great, great. All right, so there, there's more to a property than just a physical home. The yes. land around it is part of the property, and it has to be accounted for, right? So how do you go about researching and verifying the legal description of a property to know exactly what's my yard? I love when I go to a home or go to a neighborhood and I see literally the difference in the yards being cut. Like I can tell this neighbor just recently cut their yard and they stopped right there. <laughs> how, how are you finding this legal description and, and stuff? Yeah. So you have plat maps for a lot of subdivisions. Those usually are easy. Um, you can see just like where they stopped cutting the grass, where your property mm -hmm. line is. <laughs> um, but then there's other situations I run into where you don't know where the property lines are and you might have to get a survey. Um, the, but the legal description you can find on public records. Uh, and then also you want to make sure you get title work ran because that can show you, you know, easements that are on the property. If somebody's using your land for a driveway or if that oh. easement agreement is going to expire, uh, maybe with the transfer of ownership. So mm. it's very important to figure out the property lines, what property is yours? Are you 100% in control of that property? Does that property suit what you're buying that property for? Um, horses is a huge thing in like Oakland County um, and outside surrounding areas is you gotta make sure if you have a horse and you're buying a property that you're allowed to have livestock on the property and how much, right, right. Can, how much can you have? So it depends on the client really. If I have a client uh, who just wants to buy a house in a subdivision, that's usually pretty simple. But if they have horses and they're like, hey, we need to buy this house and this house has to suit this many horses because that's how many I have, mm -hmm. then I'm going to go more in depth into calling the township, uh, figuring out exactly what those restrictions are. Uh, uh, so it really depends on the client and, and the situation because every real estate transaction is different. Ah, uh, that's, yeah, that's interesting. That's, see, that's getting into a whole nother perspective. I don't think we necessarily, you don't necessarily understand or even think about that part of a transaction until you literally in the transaction. You're just thinking, I like the way this looks. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's cool. So let's get down to the science. This is your land. You only own this. And then you think like, wow. So 
that that's my tree. Like I I'm responsible for that tree and the things and and all this other type of stuff. And like yeah, I mean, and, and then like you said, there's there's certain use cases for your land that you can and cannot do depending on the coding and the zoning and the deed restrictions. And you get most of that information you said from like calling a township and getting the title insurance, calling the title company, correct? It's usually a trail, you know, you pull public records and then you're going to pull title work and you'll see some restrictions in there or Mm -hmm. you're just really covering your butt. Uh, I get my client's goals. I figure out what they want to do. And then when we go to see the house, I'm trying to find what will stop them from doing what they want to do. Oh, got you. So it's more of a due diligence process and just really knowing what your clients are looking for and making sure that the property they're buying will suit what they're trying to do. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, you, you mentioned that you are an entrepreneur. I mean, obviously being a real estate agent, you own your own business, but you actually own your own business, a convenience store in Michigan. If you don't mind me sharing, can we talk about the parallels between owning your own convenience store business and managing and operating your own real estate company? So real estate agents typically go from you know, having a regular job and then they jump into being a real estate agent and they don't realize that they are buying a business. Um, and with business, you got to track expenses. You got to know what your revenue is. You got to build a team eventually because only you're only one person. And I, I would say that the parallels between the convenience store and real estate is the convenience store forced me to make those moves right away. I can't work mm. the store. I have to hire people. Um, those people don't know what to do in there, so we got to write checklists. Uh, we have to label things. Every, everything has to be very simple so that they can understand what to do. Um, and I think that's the parallel to real estate. And owning that convenience store was supposed to be a real estate move. <laughs> uh, we wanted the building and the land. I did not want to take on a convenience store, and it just kind of took over. Um, mm. but, but while doing that, um, I learned so much about business. And it was just a better learning experience business-wise than it has been being a real estate agent. Because as a real estate agent, you can just be a real estate agent where you just go find houses, you go sell houses, that's what you do. But if you really want to hit a next level, you have to learn how to run a business. That's a great, great point, too. That's a great. So let me ask you with that, with you being, being the manager of people, with that being said, Um, from an employee standpoint, some people will feel like they're just a number. They're just, you know, they're for production, productivity, and the owner's only there. They only care about bottom line, right? How, how do you, what's your method to ensuring that your team, your team members are, are going to be in this position for for the long run. Ultimately, it's just at, like how are you like providing resources and security for your employees for them to feel like, okay, this is somewhere I can be for a long time. I feel comfortable here. Right, and I, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I'm 28 years old. We've owned that convenience store for two years. We are right in. I can't swear on here, but we're uh, right in the ugliness of building a business. It's year two. Mm. Um, so I'm learning that right now. I'm trying to create an environment where the, everybody wants to stay. And we're in Gladwin, Michigan. It's like right here. There's no, really not much economy around it. Gotcha. So we have a high turnover right now. Uh... And, and so that question you asked me is exactly what I'm trying to achieve right now is okay. how, and then this is the same thing with real estate. Mm-hmm. EXP Realty encourages their agents to bring on more agents. Right. Well, me personally, I've brought on two agents and I have not had the capacity to support them like they need to be supported. So I don't even try to recruit EXP agents right now until I build this foundation of exactly what you just asked me. A foundation where people know the values, they know what they need to do when they come to work. Mm-hmm. Um, they're appreciated. They know that they can climb, you know, to a, a next level. Right. Um, and so that's right where I'm at right now. So maybe in like two years, you ask that question, I'll have a better answer. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we appreciate the honesty. We appreciate the honesty. And um, so what about past experiences? What about some things from your 
you know, some things that you've experienced professionally and personally has shaped your perspective or impacted the way you, you look at things professionally and personally? Um, exactly that, you know, I've, um, uh, I've come into real estate and I've seen a lot of real estate teams and how they operate. And I've seen a lot of businesses everywhere I drive, I'm looking at the business and I'm like, Ooh, that's a good business. I wonder how they're staying open, you know, or, Oh man, that business looks like they're struggling. Um, and I, so, hang on, repeat the question because I was going somewhere good there. No, 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 you good. It's just basically asking how has your My past previous uh, experiences shaped your perspective exactly, now? Exactly, exactly. So, um, I pretty much am taking businesses that I love and businesses that I'm not really too fond of. Mm. And trying to cultivate that into my what who I am and my business and what I appreciate with a leader or with a team and how I want it to look. The the military um, was that if I can make my business exactly how the military has broken down and done what they did and build a culture like they did and how they motivated me to just be different than who I was before I joined the military and pick up their culture and their uh, core values. That's what I would like to do. And and that's what I've taken from my experiences is I need to build the business just like the Air Force. And uh, that's what my logo is all about. I don't know if you've noticed that, but like, I know, did I, actually, I did. That's funny that you mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've taken the same core values from the military and that's my, my, own my real estate's business values. Um, the Eagle in there is just like mm -hmm. the air force Eagle. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's got a little roof, but that's really a Chevron, like a rank. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Get it. So, so it, my, your whole life, everything you've been, everything you've been through, your experiences, what you've learned, uh, you can take in the best, I think the best uh, lessons are what you don't want to do. So uh, oh. just, yeah, taking everything that you've experienced and trying to build a business out of that, good and bad. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're definitely not the first guest we've had on the show who's been in the, served in the military, but also used the, the principles from the military and applied it to your business and your everyday life. And uh, I mean, like, literally, I've heard that same thing. I feel like that, th that that speaks volumes to, like, the type of person you can become, the type of discipline that you get when you leave from there. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and how you can apply it to become very successful. So that's... It's that's amazing. Uh, I mean, you got 17-year-old kids coming straight out of high school, never had a job before. And they teach them how to build planes and work on planes yeah, and, yeah. and and go do these crazy things. I mean, the military does crazy things. And the only way they can take a 17-year-old out of high school to learn how to do something like that is by having values, having direction, breaking things down into the smallest pieces. Uh, you, you hear a lot of people in the military where they feel like they didn't do much. Mm. And really, they did a lot. It's just they broke the process down so much that... You can't really feel your mistakes as much or you can't feel your um, accomplishments as much, I guess. It's kind of a give and take there, but yeah, that's how they do it. Yeah, yeah. Probably just overlook it and don't even realize like what you've built after you, you know, you look back and be like, wow, I, I did this. But yeah, yes. people just think of it as, you know, I just I was just there. But and no, that's, that's what it would probably point. feel like with a big team that's synchronized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Random question for you. Uh, if you had unlimited resources and time, what yeah. type of project would you work on and why? That's my goal is to have unlimited resources and time. That That's Ooh. literally why I wake Ooh. up. That's what I do. And if I had that, I, I would love to be a full time baseball coach or, or coach of my kid. Just whatever he's doing. That's OK. That That's my five year plan right there. I feel yeah. that, man. Oh, man. yeah. I love that. I love to hear that, man. I, I, that, that's a new one right there. That just put a smile on my face. I love it, man. I love <laughs> watching my son right now slap the t-ball and yeah. play basketball and box the little thing. Yeah, man. I, I would love that, too, yeah. man. That's a father's dream right there, man. Yeah. Well, well, thank you so much for pulling up a chair, being here. We appreciate you for being a guest. At this point, if you have any last words and or want to tell the people how to reach out to you, please do so now. Yeah, um, you can call me 248-464-5035 if you have any questions about buying real estate, investing in real estate, uh, Airbnbs, rentals, flips, 
Um, I'm kind of in all of that right now, owning a business. Um, but yeah, two four eight four six four five zero three five. Cool. Leave cool. a voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But make sure you reach out. More importantly, so thank you again for being here. Thank you for being a guest at this point for our YouTube audience. If you got into this point in the episode, now is your chance to hit that like button, please, and thank you. Make sure you also share the content and subscribe to our channel. And if you are listening on Apple, Spotify, or any other podcast platforms, please do the same. It's a like, a five-star rating, and make sure you also subscribe for our latest content. I always like to leave our audience with a question to make them think on the way out the door. What did you or someone you know have to do to improve your or their credit score and history? How did they do it? Let us know in the comments below. Besides that, talk to you next time.